Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is host Richard Bernoulli, and today is May 25th. We have Charles Hugh Smith. Charles is author, leading global finance blogger, and America's philosopher, we call him. He's the author of several books on our economy and society, including A Radically Beneficial World, Automation Technology and Creating Jobs for All, Resistance, Revolution, Liberation, A Model for a Positive Change, The Nearly Free University and the Emerging Economy, also Pathfinding Our Destiny, Preventing the Final Fall of Our Democratic Republic, and also Will You Be Richer or Poorer, and his most recent book, Global Crisis National Renewal, A Revolutionary Grand Strategy for the United States. His blog of twominds.com is one of C. NBC's top alternative finance sites. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Richard. I, I always think that when I hear that list of books, I'm thinking, here's a guy that doesn't know how to stop himself, you know, from writing another book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you've got great insight. And, uh, you know, not only the books, but on, on your blog. And recently you've written about um, the, the recession, um, as you see it uh, coming, that looks like it will last longer. Can, can you elaborate on, on the points of your of your blog post recently? Yeah, uh, I'd love to, Richard. And of course, I think that this is a, a very important topic because um, it's, it's a recency bias situation in which um, everyone who is younger than like 60 years old has never experienced what I call a real recession. And by real recession, I mean a recession that does what the the, the necessary work that a recession should do in a free market economy. And um, the reason why no one under the age of 60 has, has experienced a real recession is the last real recession was 40 years ago in 1981 to 1982. And, um, and so every recession since then has been very shallow and very quick, a, a, a few months essentially because the Federal Reserve um, and the fiscal um, authorities have jumped in and, and uh, sort of rescued the economy from any, any downturn. But in doing so, they've crippled uh, a key mechanism in um, what you might call free market capitalism, which is a credit cycle and a business cycle go hand in hand, right? As credit expands, then people spend more money, businesses expand to meet the demand, New supply comes online, and it's a it's a virtuous uh, self um, reinforcing cycle, right? The consumers are getting wealthier, their yep. um, companies are making more profits, and so on. But at some point, um, everybody gets greedy, and so the, the lenders continue to lend uh, to, uh, to to re to reap the profits from lending. They extend their their uh, credit to uh, people who really and and enterprises that aren't really credit worthy. Those um, individuals and enterprises invest in speculative ventures that then go belly up and then they default and then and then you get a credit contraction. Now, in, a, in the normal course of things, that's absolutely necessary. You've got to get rid of the bad debt and um, sweep it away, take the losses, and then you can set up for a, a new cycle of growth because people now trust the system um, and, um, and lenders have been either... Uh, become insolvent and disappeared, or they've, um, they've re returned to prudent lending. So anyways, that, that's, what, uh, that's what I call a real recession. And since uh, very few people have actually experienced it. And so a real recession is, is quite long, it's quite deep, and it, it, it only works uh, to clear the deadwood if you let the defaults happen and you take the losses. And that's what it seems like the Federal Reserve the whole idea is to avoid that and then just go back to the same old plan of uh, bring demand forward by, by uh, juicing credit, expanding credit and, and reducing interest rates. And now finally, after 40 years, the cycle's turned and that's not uh, gonna be possible. And I think you can, you can elaborate on why it's, uh, you can't go back to zero interest rate policy.
no, you're totally right. Absolutely. This is this is chaos, and we've reached the end point, in my opinion, um, of, of this debt game. Uh, what's happened is there's been continuous borrowing, and even during the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009, the solution was to add even more credit. Uh, at that time, it was possible because there was still some, some room uh, some slack to to go lower on on interest rates so that the servicing costs of the overall debt uh, would be still you know accommodating and not too bad. But but what recently happened actually uh, in 2000, uh, 2020 uh, is the interest rates started per percolating up naturally uh, initially in the in the repo market. So this is back in like March of 2020. And uh, so, you know, everybody was beginning to realize that. And uh, it's it's basically the end game because there's just no way to add more debt. Uh, interest rates uh, have been going higher and continue to go higher. Um, and we'll, we'll get into also the inflation dynamics, which will keep interest rates high as well. Uh, the Fed continues to increase interest rates at, at the low end. Um, and it's not likely uh, that they'll go lower. I think it, even at, at best, they may pause for some time, but not likely to go lower. Um, and uh, we actually just did a podcast yesterday with uh, Kevin Muir, who's, who's uh, a great friend with Louis Vincent Gave, which we've done a lot of podcasts in the past with and um, he thinks it's 1982 in reverse. So, uh, you know, lining up with the time frame that you just mentioned, Charles, um, this, this is now, uh, we're, we're now gonna go into reverse um, from, from uh, 82, you know, where interest rates have been going lower and bond prices higher and all this borrowing and more and more debt. I think it's the end game. So yeah, 1982 in reverse, was the title of our podcast yesterday. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, also there's other people that are observing you just saw our podcast today by uh, economist Daniel Lacalle. He's also an Austrian school economist based in Spain, and he's talking about stagflation. Um, and so I wanna just elaborate a little bit on this before we going into the detail on your blog post, if that's okay, Charles. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, like in our discussion yesterday on the 1982 in reverse and other um, uh, you know analysis that we've done, what what we see is a balancing between monetary policy and fiscal policy. And by that I mean you have a situation where on the monetary policy we're getting tightening, we're getting rising interest rates. Uh, and that's actually leading a lot of people to believe that, oh, no, we're, we're going to head into deflation and it could be a deflationary depression and all this. But but they're not seeing the other side of the equation, which is fiscal stimulus. So there's a lot of fiscal stimulus happening um, and also related policies that are inflationary. So by that, I mean things like um, the the covid lockdowns which caused you know significant supply chain disruptions which then caused inflation um, you've got the the war situation with the ukraine that that's been causing a lot of inflation um, you've also got these uh, climate type of policies you know where there's a lot of anti fossil fuels sentiment and even actions that, that are happening, you know, attacking the oil and gas sector um, to the point of not being able to operate or, or to look for additional oil wells or, or to expand. Uh, and so what's happening is that is, is causing uh, supply chain uh, sh shortages, right, in, in the energy sector and even in the fertilizers, right? So we're seeing a lot of that now um, places like in the Netherlands and Canada, you know, where the governments are are cracking down on fertilizer usage, 
uh, it's just total insanity because, you know, in the, in the name of reducing emissions, you know, using uh, natural gas in many cases, right, to make chemical fertilizers. So, so uh, you know, they're basically uh, going against fertilizer. That, that's going to have a massive effect on the, the output of, of crops, right, of food. You're going to have rising food prices. So you have rising energy prices from what I mentioned earlier. You have rising food prices coming soon. It's all inflationary. So, um, and if you sum the this inflationary versus deflationary forces, you get a net inflationary force, and that really is what the the governments want. Uh, and if 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 the deflationary forces are are a little bit stronger, they'll they'll rev up the inflationary side, because the the in the end game in this ties into our theme of this program show, which is financial repression. So, you know, we, we had the repressed interest rates regime. Now it's a different tool of financial repression. It's, it's inflation. So a net inflation, if you do the math, will reduce the burden of the unsustainable government debt and the unsustainable unfunded liabilities. That That's the big problem. That That's the macro problem here. Um, and so uh, when you do the math, 4% uh, inflation for 10 years reduces the burden of debt by one half, approximately. So um, that, 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 that's what you have. So, so it's basically financial repression, but a net uh, inflationary environment, a stagflation, uh, you know, flowing economy, rising inflation at the same time, 1982 in reverse. And that basically sets the stage of why you're very correct in your observation. If you wanted to go through some of the points uh, uh, of your blog post, uh, Charles, in, in terms of the uh, recession. Yeah, I would just add a, um, something I wrote about today. Uh, one of the other um, conduits for uh, secularly higher inflation is higher wages. And I, I posted a bunch of charts from the Federal Reserve database showing that um, wages share of the national income has been declining. It declined for, for basically 45 years, the whole period we're talking about. Um, and it, a lot of this was the result, the, the general story is, uh, some of this is that um, globalization and financialization, the two big drivers of the economy over the last 40 years, they both favor capital for, over labor, right? Because uh, offshoring of production and globalization um, pushes the uh, American and, and uh, other developed countries' labor forces into competition with much uh, lower wage uh, developing nations. And so um, that's a deflationary element that's now reversed for as globalization itself reverses and wages are rising in, in the developing world. Like for example, I, I just saw a chart from my, <clears throat> that, um, that the wage, the, the, the basic hourly wage for production workers in China has quadrupled from $2 an hour to the equivalent of eight to 10. So, you know, in other words, the cycle has turned and in terms of, of interest rates, I just want to mention that there's a technical analysis case for that as well. Um, technical analysts that, that have been around for decades, like Louise Yamada, she's been talking about anticipating a turn in the, in the bond um, yield and, and interest rate cycle for a decade, because she said this is really long in tooth, right? Most bond yield cycles last like maybe 25, 30 years, and this one is 40 years long. So we're, we're due for a, um, a reversal of that. So wages going up is a secular trend, I believe, and never mind um, AI and automation. <laughs> um, and um, the other thing I want to mention is uh, another factor in this is cheap credit raises um, costs. In other words, you can get away with raising your prices and wages if, if credit is uh, gets gets cheaper because people will eventually and governments everyone will just say well i can just borrow a little more money so you know the room rates at the hotels rise and and the wages for government workers go up and and everybody's like oh it's okay we can manage because 
you know, tax revenues are up because everybody can borrow more money at a cheaper rate. But those fixed those fixed costs come back to haunt you, and it, once um, the economy starts stagnating or uh, becomes recessionary, because those costs only work in an environment with with super low interest rates and everybody in the economy borrowing more because interest rates have been dropping for decades. And so once interest rates start going up, that that whole game falls apart, and it suddenly you have the, your legacy costs are locked in at a very high level and your debt costs are going up and suddenly your your uh, consumers are are buckling under the debt that that they already have so um this is what i see happening especially in the municipal and state government and provincial governments is these government agencies and local governments have borrowed uh stupendous amounts of money you know through through bonds um and now they're going to have to start paying more uh, interest, and that's going to cripple their ability to, to borrow so much money to cover their costs. But meanwhile, they've agreed to labor contracts and and uh, you know rents on government offices and all this, which are sky high. You know, so the legacy costs are going to crush everybody that's um, facing um, a slowing economy. Th that would be a point I'd mention. The other one is, you know, we talk about deflation and inflation. We can have an inflationary real economy. Of, of wages and prices and supply chains and, and all that. But, and we can have deflation in asset bubbles. <laughs> in other words, you know, the value of real estate and, and stocks can fall um, and they should as, as profits get, get crimped, right? So you can have deflation um, in, in, in assets, which were, which were artificially boosted by these same policies we've talked about. So as those policies reverse, then speculative um, Speculative bubbles tend to pop, and um, then then you get a, a reverse wealth effect. So um, that's another factor that that means that in that the next recession will likely not be three months long, <laughs> because the wealth effect is you know a lag a lag effect, and um, bubbles always pop. And so we've we've been trained to think that there's the bubbles are endless. You you know the third bubble pops, then we'll just create a fourth bubble. And it's like no, you can't get a fourth bubble once interest rates start going up, right? So um, there's that. And one last point, um, which I didn't put in the blog is, you know, the, if we look at this as a class uh, sort of analysis of the economy, you know, there's uh, the rich and the poor and the middle class in between. And so who gets hurt when defaults um, start soaring is, of course, banks and, and the wealthy, because they're the ones who own the debt. You know, the auto loan packages, the student loans, the mortgage backed securities, it's all owned by the top, you know, basically 5% and the majority even less. So, and who owns, who owes all that money is the bottom 90%, right? So if there's a, uh, if, if the, if the system were to clean out all the bad debt and, and uh, our unpayable debt, um, then who's going to get hurt, of course, is the lenders and the wealthy who are going to get stiffed because, um, you know the 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 debt they own uh, will be um, get a haircut because a lot of people have defaulted. So there is a class kind of element to this that the the status quo is trying to protect the lenders and the wealthy from defaults. But if you don't let the if you don't clear the system of the deadwood, and, and my analogy has always been a forest fire, right? You have to let the the deadwood get burned off, and if you want to regrow your forest, right? Then you're 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 uh, you're you're basically burdening your economy, so it's it's going to be stagnant for decades. And I believe that's really the primary lesson of Japan. They never really had a debt clearing event. They never allowed it. They thought they could get away with just sort of bleeding it off. And so, 30 years later, they're still crippled with a lot of um, zombie corporations uh, with zombie debts um, that were never cleared. Yeah, and I would go even further. Uh, what, what I'm seeing is uh, a dichotomy between the indebted Western world, namely US, Canada, Western Europe, you know, type of countries uh, versus the what's now being referred to as the global south or the BRICS aligned countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and, and other countries that are aligned to that. Um, where I see a lot of these countries, the BRICS and the Global South, have now much 
lower inflation rates than the indebted Western world, uh, but also a lower uh, debt to GDP ratio. So it used to be the other way around, right? In these emerging markets that were, you know, debt ridden and had all kinds of challenges on that in the developed world had low rates of inflation. But I, I think what we're seeing now is the opposite. And um, I think to that extent, uh, because of this long-term recessionary um, view that you have, and, and the fact that there's other places in the world that might be better, I, I think that there's going to be a a potential draw right of of the population out of the indebted western world to the global south right to move for better opportunities um and th i actually think the the reason for a lot of the world economic forum pro programs and and uh, initiatives are actually centered around that to prevent brain drain and, and wealth drain so the these 15 minute cities they're talking about the digital ids central bank digital currencies, which are programmable, right, and, and could be programmed to have no value outside of your country or have a time value. I think a, a lot of this is intended to try to retain the capital, uh, you know, intellectual capital and, and monetary financial capital within the indebted Western world to prevent that from, from leaving. Your, your thoughts on that, uh, Charles? Yeah, I think that's a great um, a great insight, Richard. And um, we see this, and you and I have discussed it off off um, off our recording time uh, many times that people are voting with their feet for precisely this reason. In other words, Americans who can uh, make money remotely, they're escaping like an economy in which they young people especially cannot afford a house, they can't afford health care, and and so they move to Portugal or Bolivia or I mean you know many other countries that have a much lower cost basis and they find of course life is is much more affordable than um in the u.s or in the the, the really uh, high cost uh european nations so uh, there's that you can vote with your feet and then you can move your capital and and as you say that um that could bleed the developed countries dry in in, in some way if, if capital and talent um leave or escape and so I, I want to make, um, I think those are excellent points. And I just want to mention two other quick, like systemic um, features, uh, which I see here in the, in the upcoming recession, which is um, diminishing returns. And of course, this is um, a feature that we see in a lot of things. Everything from taking medications that the medication starts wearing, wearing off, you know, it, it, you have to keep increasing the dose to get the same effect. And so we've seen these things with um, monetary stimulus and, and GDP, and, and we've seen this sort of ratio where, you know, when you first lower interest rates and expand credit, you get this big boost in your GDP. And then if you keep trying the same trick, you know, 30 years later, then the, 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 the boost is just infinitesimal. You know, it's like really modest. You know, you might get a, you know, 1% growth even though you're doing 10 times the stimulus. And so that's the danger here, both monetary and fiscal, is the system quickly um, adapts to whatever stimulus you're, you're providing, and then it becomes the baseline. So you know, if you, then you, you pump in huge amounts of money that, that used to create a, a real uh, heavy uh, response, it, now it, it barely causes a blip, right? So, that is is a is a real killer, I think, in terms of the system. You know that they they the the upper boundary of of getting results is now so insane that it'll that it'll break the system. And so you know, in other words, if you're going to have to print ten trillion dollars <laughs> to to buy the government debt because the the government's borrowing ten trillion dollars to fund stimulus, it's like no, that's going to break the system on its own. So diminishing returns and then. The system is, uh, the global financial system is a very, it's a tightly bound system, which, which, which means that it's, it's highly interlocked, interconnected. So you don't get one domino chain, you know, toppling in isolation. That domino, you get one line of dominoes toppling, it's going to topple 10 more, and then they're going to, each topple 10 and then pretty soon you're going to have a hundred domino chains falling 
because of one systemic um, problem, you know? And so you, you, I, I think that is what I see is that when you, when you, when you've, you've created tremendous systemic fragility by making the system utterly dependent on massive amounts of fiscal and monetary stimulus and, and, and credit always dropping, those, once those conditions change, then the system cannot possibly adjust, you know, for, the, for those reasons, you know, it's a tightly bound system and there's diminishing returns. So it's, it's interesting to look at those systemic um, dynamics that, that don't, you can't really fix those with some kind of policy tweak. Totally right. Those, those are great points, Charles, and just wanted to add to that, um, there's also the, the dynamics of, of, of excessive debt, unsustainable debt at this point, uh, raising the question of how, how, how are you going to do all these renewable energy programs or green energy initiatives um, given unsustainable debt and that we've reached the limit of, of that uh, debt super cycle over the, over the last several decades. Um, so that, that that's a big question, um, because a lot of these policies, you know, as I mentioned earlier, anti-fossil fuel, anti-fertilizer, um, are are on the presumption that you're going to have renewables. Now, you know, don't don't get me wrong, I'm I'm all for renewables, and uh, you know, not polluting uh, uh, or adding pollutants uh, to to, uh, to to the environment. Or adding more more carbon to the environment, right? I'm all for those type of programs that uh, are are not or minimizing carbon to be added or or, or doing uh, carbon sequestration. All for that. Um, but look, at, you, you've got to be reasonable. Uh, the and the oil and gas companies have ex massive free cash flows. They are uh, going to play a significant role in in helping us to get out of this through investment in renewables like this. Four oil and gas companies um, that are investing in, for example, nuclear fusion energy, right? So they they have the the equity in 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 private companies that are are developing fusion energy, uh, which is which is going to be a you know a virtually unlimited source of energy at very low cost, scalable and available globally, and it's and robust, uh, unlike uh, solar and wind, which will form some some of that as well but but um yeah so th you know they're going to help us get out uh, we, we need to recognize that there needs to be a transition strategy to to help us get there but um you know the governments uh, i don't know you know to what extent they're going to be able to help um and 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 then you have uh, other dynamics happening as well um the the movement uh, because of geopolitical concerns of of some governments out of U.S. debt, and even you know increasing the reserves uh, into uh, into gold, for example, you know China, Singapore, a lot of these countries are, are doing that. And it's not that that they think me you know gold will go up. It's just to diversify out of the U.S. dollar, out of U.S. debt. Um, you know, with a concern that the dollar may be going down, or also to limit the the uh, the potential of of leverage, geopolitical you know political leverage on themselves if if they hold this right that the U.S. would have over them. So I think that there's a lot of that going on. Uh, you also have the debt ceiling, uh, you know, debate that's going on that could unleash another. Uh, perhaps 1.7 trillion right in new in new uh, debt issuance in, in the very short term flooding the market so it's just you know trying to solve you know the a debt problem with more debt is is total insanity your, your thoughts on that Charles right uh, absolutely and there's like a debt saturation point when enterprises households and governments really can't take on any more debt without increasing their risk. Um, and so I, I, I would sort of uh, cap that this conversation by saying um, the you know, we all know that capital goes where it's treated best, right? And, and part of that is capital, I think, is, is an, in a secular long-term cyclical 
you know, sort of analysis. Capital is now demanding a, a higher return because global risks are higher. It's just that simple, you know, that risk and return are still connected. And so when the world was uh, basking in the glories of, of, of um, deflationary globalization and endless financialization, then the systemic risk seemed low, you know, the, the glorious, you know, 2000s and all of that. And so now it's clear that the risks are higher on multiple fronts. And so capital as a whole has to demand a higher return to compensate for that higher risk. And so, and in the same way that labor has to demand higher wages to compensate for higher costs and higher inflation. Otherwise, you, you can't pay your workforce less than living wages and then think that they're going to be just fine. <laughs> You're going to have a, you know, a broad political revolt because people, you know, that's what happens when you, when people can't afford to live on their, on their earnings. So, you know, we always like to end on like, what, what's the positive note here? And it's like, well, yeah. it's, I would say number one, and this sounds like some kind of old advice from Ben Franklin or something, but it, it is tried and true to uh, reduce your debt, <laughs> you know, and not take on any more. And assume that if you're in a two income household or you have a multiple um, income streams, assume one of them is going to go away. In other words, assume you're going to live or you're going to have to live on half of your of what you live on now. And of course, um, we all know what happens when you start you know, making more money is your, your expenses tend to rise. But we tend to forget that we actually did live pretty well and we're pretty happy on a much smaller income. So to kind of bulletproof yourself against um, the vagarities of a deep, you know, prolonged recession, then number one, get rid of debt now, if at all possible. And then, um, and then just reduce your cost basis and fixed costs. You know, the things that you can't, that, that are, are not based on disposable income. These are the, your fixed costs like healthcare, you know, rent, mortgage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you, you know, you want to get rid of all that stuff, if at all possible, and and um, yeah, lighten lighten the ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah. There's several things that could be done depending on the situation. Um, I mean, you've written a lot about these type of ideas and suggestions in your blog post and in your books. Um, and uh, before we get into that, uh, also just wanted to mention. Uh, you know what uh what we talked about earlier this you know flight to other countries right that uh, that might be a solution for some you know where it's maybe lower cost of living as as you mentioned um the other way is to go inland right or to go into the countryside of of your uh area in in the indebted western world like to countryside areas the f farming areas uh, which are lower cost structure, maybe you can do work from home for, from these locations. Um, and also, uh, you know, making use uh, and more emphasis on, on technology innovation uh, in, in, in solutions in ways of life as well. And, uh, and you've written a lot of books. Uh, uh, if you can go into a few suggestions as well in, in terms of, um, you know, investing in your own capital and personal um, structure and education, if you wanted to elaborate on those as well, Charles, for solutions. Yeah, Richard, I think I want to um, I want to uh, emphasize my support of your idea of moving because, you know, um, it, John Kenneth Galbraith, the economist, he wrote a book, I believe it was in the late 70s or early 80s. That it was a short book, and he basically said, if you want to change your life, your best, the best bet is just to move. Because he said, trying to change the system you're in that's like um, dysfunctional, you know, and and uh, su and suppressing, it's like just move, you know. <laughs> and so I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. If you move to like cities that are um, much cheaper, um, and there, there's many, many such cities in the U.S. and the Midwest, as you say, or small towns, um, or you know, rural communities. Then, uh, yeah, you you can uh, you can get by on much less, and you can, and uh, you can also grow some of your own food, or or connect with people who are growing 
food and raising livestock on their own. So you can get a much more resilient lifestyle outside of um, the urban centers. So that's, that's fantastic, I think. And um, yeah, I, I, I wrote a book called um, Unconventional um, Guide um, to Investing. And basically, it, it's, it's all about diversification and investing in stuff that you control, as opposed to investing in some ETF or mutual fund that's really out of your hands. So, um, and we've talked about diversification. That's, that's also great. And anything you can do to boost, um, boost your skill set in, in terms of um, being able to do more things to create value, you know, I, that's, that's what I, I, I mean by investing in yourself, you know, because there's certain, certain capabilities and skills are always going to be in demand. And, and there's quite a few of those. I mean, taking care of children, taking care of old folks, um, uh, being able to communicate clearly, um, problem solve, um, systems management, um, growing, you know, agriculture. <laughs> construction. I mean, there's just a ton of fields that, that no matter, even in a recessionary economy, they're still in demand. So, because they're, they're the foundation of civilization. So yeah. I think that's, that's where I would, um, that's where I would focus uh, my, that's where I'm focusing my efforts. Let's put it that way. Yeah, no, it's excellent. You've written so much about these ideas in your books and uh, just great, great insight, Charles. How can our listeners learn more about your work? Yeah, please visit me at of2minds.com and you can read free chapters of my of my latest books on self-reliance and um, burnout and um, and other topics. Yeah, that would be very helpful and beneficial. Thank you so much, Charles, for your insight okay. and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk. 